Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode eight of the Clarity Podcast. The title of this week's episode is The Reluctant Watchman. I'm your host, Claire, and this week we had a great opportunity to interview Doug Knighting, the author of the ReluctantWatchman.com website. We had a great discussion tonight all about Doug's journey coming out of the church and how coming out of the church to come closer to Christ really brought him clarity in his life. All this and more on this week's episode of the Clarity Podcast. Everyone has a journey they're walking. And along that road, we are met with potholes, road bumps, rain, storms, and sometimes just fog. But through it all, we're really just looking for one thing, clarity. Clarity so we can walk with confidence in that next step. There's one source I run to for that clarity. In the darkest of nights, Jesus offers me light that shines through even the thickest storms. Welcome to the Clarity Podcast, where we find clarity through the one who saves us all. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode eight of the Clarity Podcast. Today's guest is the reluctant watchman. The cat's out of the bag, guys. The reluctant watchman is Doug Knighting, and I am so excited to have him on our podcast tonight. Thank you so much, Doug, for coming and being on our podcast. Hey, Claire, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, to being able to have a chat with you tonight. Yeah, you're so welcome. I want to just jump right in and go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience. Tell them who you are, how old you are, where you're from, and tell us a little bit about yourself and your life currently. Yeah, so a little bit of a background. So born and raised in eastern Idaho. Um, my my background, or at least my heritage, comes from that farming community. So small eastern Idaho community, Louisville is where my my uh, grandfather parents grew up. So really hardworking people, just down to earth, um, very hardworking. Uh, with that came a lot of like uh, maybe a lack of patience. Like my, they were very strict. My, my, I, I have stories of my grandparents and they're, they're a little bit strict and that got passed on to my dad. He was pretty strict in some of the ways that he, he raised us. But um, as much as I, I analyze my dad's life, I have to appreciate the work ethic that he instilled in us. And that, that was really a beautiful thing. Um, both of my parents have passed on and I actually live in the home that I grew up in. So that's kind of an interesting little note. Um, so I'm back with neighbors that I grew up with. And it's it's really kind of an interesting turn of events. But yeah, born and raised here, really my childhood. Um, I don't know if a tip, if any childhood is typical, but hunted, fished. Um, the Boy Scout program was really the heart and soul of at least our growing up because I have five brothers. And my dad was a scout master for as long as I can remember. And so everything we did was scout related. Um, scout and church related. So all of that um, went kind of together. Um, so born in the covenant, you know, my parents um, met, married, had all of us uh, boys. So born in the covenant, um, my dad had a little bit of a, a rough period of his childhood. Um, his dad died when, or my grandfather died when my dad was 17. So some interesting things that went on in his life, but when he came to know the gospel, he really um, gravitated to it. I think later in his life, my dad ended up attending the temple at least once a week for over 20 years. So he lived as best he could the gospel. Um, so that was that was really just my beginning of my upbringing. From, from graduating uh, high school, I uh, went and served my mission to Spain. So uh, southern coast of Spain was my mission. Really some amazing two years. Like, like really spectacular two years of the lessons that I learned there. And I, and I say lessons learned, like a lot of things to do and a lot of things not to do. Like I learned a lot of things about culture. Um, really, really fascinating two years. Um, when I got back from, from that, from my mission, I ended up going up to Rick's college and in between semesters, I met my wife and we got married shortly after we met and then had uh, our kids after that. So Currently, we have uh, four kids, two boys, two girls. Um, you know, we love our kids, and they're they're a handful on occasion. So when we got married, had kids, we've moved, I think, 10, 10 to 12 times, something like that, since we've been married. So it's been really, what, what that, one thing it did for us is we got to meet a lot of friends. We got to see different 
we got to see different leadership styles within wards. And that was really kind of a fascinating thing to see how one stake president would do something or one bishop would do something. I think four or five of those years, though, were really in the heart of, of Mormon country. So down in Utah County, that was interesting to be able to see just the nuts and bolts of how the culture played out. In that, in that one neighborhood that I lived in in Highland, one family out of the entire neighborhood was not LDS. And it was a, the ward was an entire single square block, wow. uh, one mile, it was a one mile block. So that's how condensed um, the neighborhood, um, the population of, of members were down there. But uh, yeah, so anyways, after that, I eventually moved from Utah back up here to Eastern Idaho and uh, have just been enjoying um, the work. I, I work independently. I do uh, freelance work, my degrees in graphic design and really enjoy the creative field. So I do a lot of photography, videography, and anything related to graphic design, um, that type of work. So any other questions? Yeah, that's so awesome. So I'm going to loop back around to your experience in Utah a little bit later. But for now, I want to jump back to your childhood. And I want you to tell me a little bit more in detail what part the Mormon Church played in your childhood. It sounds like your family has been long standing members of the Mormon Church. So you were born into the Mormon Church. And what did that mean for you as a child? What did that look like? And what did that feel like for you when you were growing up? So growing up in the church, the church was everything. Um, it permeated the social fabric of our lives. It was everything. The Everybody we associated with essentially were members of the church. Every Sunday we would go and we would meet with members of the church. Um, all of our youth activities were all members of the church. And I think even at school, it was at least 80% of the members or 80% of the students in my high school were members of the church. And so really a heavy population. So my childhood was that that was it um we didn't do anything that really was outside of that we studied scriptures as a family as often as we could and um, we weren't perfect at it um so yeah that's i mean it it pretty much just was everything to us it all aspects of our life were were in the church yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense and i think it's super common story for people who are long lines of the mormon church right so Tell me a little bit about your teenage years. So what role did Jesus Christ play when you're hitting these ages where we start to come to an understanding of Jesus Christ and maybe what he did for us? Did you have an understanding when you were growing up and when you were a teenager? My understanding of Christ and his role, I would say whatever the church position was at the time, that's what I understood as Christ's role. I saw him as a redeemer, as a savior. Um, I think I, I don't know if I had completely through my teenage years had read the Book of Mormon all the way through. I, we studied it and I could see the doctrine that was presented there. And I, and I, and I have to believe that I had a, some witness of Christ as my savior. And I could feel that love. In fact, I know, I know that it was there because that's what I held on to later in my life. So I know that those roots were planted and that I did feel them. So there was, there was a little bit of this idea though of fear toward Christ, at least this concept of judgment, definitely this idea of, am I going to be damned forever because of my actions? Like, you know, you see the imperfections of, of a teenager. We know ourselves pretty well and we see our faults and we know when we do things that are wrong and we're just like shoot how is this going to play out and there was this idea that you needed to hit a certain level of righteousness and to some degree we wore that as a badge of honor to a degree the that we were trying to do better than other people so the culture led to a sense of judging other people because they maybe they I don't know, did drugs or they, or they drank or some other thing, maybe swearing, that would be a good example, right? Like, oh no, those people used language that was different than mine. Oh, we're, we're so much better. And so there was a little bit of a judgment on my part as far as um, seeing people and thinking, oh, they're, they're just not living up to the standards that they should be. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually just talking to my mom about that the other night where I was telling her, you know, when I was a teenager, I had so much fear because I was like the quote unquote perfect Molly Mormon girl in other people's eyes. 
And in my mind, it's not that I was like aiming to be better than anybody else. I just wanted to be as good as I possibly could be for God. And whenever I messed up, I fell apart because I was so afraid that I was going to not please God and not make it back to God. That I think that was a really big cultural thing. So I definitely see what you're saying there. So, so I'm assuming you were baptized when you were eight years old. Is that correct? Yeah, I actually have a visual, a picture in my mind of when I was baptized. I remember a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. I remember feeling like I was trying to do something that was right. Do I understand? I don't think I understood at all the implications of what I was doing at the time, mm -hmm. other than I felt that I was doing something that was right. Yeah, that makes sense. So then you grew up, you lived your teenage years, and you went on a mission to Spain. So what made you decide that you wanted to serve a mission? It is what you did. Um, the pressure to serve a mission, the peer pressure to serve a mission is is intense. It's just what you do. And I do have to temper that a little bit in that I, could, I would see missionaries, like the, the concept of a mission was talked up so much. I had elevated missionaries to a status of rock stars when I was younger, I would see an elder or a sister and I would just be like, wow, those guys are missionaries. Like it was, I elevated them. And I think in part it's because leaders elevate themselves. So we have, we create a caste system within the church, but I would see missionaries and I thought, wow, those, those guys are amazing. And so, yeah, going, going on my mission, I remember leaving my home and the highway in front of our home has a field in between us and our home. And I remember looking back at my house and almost wanting to break down because I'm just like, I am not going to see that for two years. Like, do I even understand what that means? And uh, it was tough. It was tough to go out. You know, there was homesickness that came um, with it, but massive amounts of pressure to go, like, like incredible amount of peer pressure to go. Yeah. So did you feel that that elevation you were describing? Did you feel that within yourself when you were that missionary? Did you feel that like, I am the Lord's anointed? <laughs> did you feel that a lot? No, no, I don't No, I don't think I did. And maybe it's because of the experience that I had right out of the gate. Um, I had this vision in my head. I had been told actually that the mission president is selecting the very best missionaries to train you. Trainers are the best missionaries in the entire mission. Within a week or two, I found out that my trainer should have been sent home, but he begged the mission president to let him train and he would do better. So I got a missionary that, that really broke so many rules. And as, as much as I could say, you know, I could cast judgment on whatever happened with that. I'm so grateful for the experience I had to see a missionary doing his one thing and then me having a decision to say, I get to, I get to live the gospel the way I want to. And it helped me stand up against a senior missionary, right? He was my trainer. He's a senior. He gets to make decisions as a senior missionary. It helped me realize later in my mission, like, no, you can do what you want to do, you know, regardless of what he says or doesn't. We got in we got in arguments. Um, it was an interesting experience to go through that with my first trainer. And then I just saw missionaries realizing that they have all the problems that everyone has in the world. We're just trying to do our best uh, to teach people about Christ. Ho hopefully, at least hopefully that was our goal. Yeah, it sounds like you had a pretty humble and teachable spirit when you were on your mission. You were one of the missionaries that went to actually teach the gospel which is fantastic because I know there's a lot of like both sides of missionaries serving in the past and now in the present too. So tell me a little bit about how you felt after the mission. Do you feel like the mission made you was a big role player in the man you are today? Like, you know, people say all the time. You know, one of the things that that is drilled into missionaries is exact obedience to rules. And there's a big distinction there. I remember, I think it was my younger brother. He said, when I came from home from my mission, he's like, I didn't, I didn't recognize you. It was, it was an interesting place to come home because the gospel had been everything for two years. You eat, drink, sleep, and breathe the gospel. 
And you also eat, drink, and sleep reporting and trying to meet goals. And so it did teach me, one thing it did do is it taught me how to work really hard, even though you weren't seeing results. We had a one of my companions in the city of Almeria. I think we knocked something like 800 doors in a week. And I think, I think we taught one discussion in that week. And I actually called it my, the, uh, the hallways of hell because we would go into these apartments, we would ring the little bell and we would get somebody to let us in because you had to get through the gate. We'd go up to the top floor and then we would just spiral all the way down the staircases, knocking every single door. We did this day in, day out, day in, day out. I knocked more doors trying to speak with people in that week than I did the remaining year of my mission. It, I, I had such an aversion to knocking doors after that, that I knocked fewer doors the rest of my year of my mission than I did that one week. And so it, it did teach me to work really hard and to realize that, um, you know, it, it's an interesting phenomenon within a church. Um, the church has found out that missionaries who go to missions with very low success rates, and if they're able to endure that, have set within themselves, um, they, they almost have a lifelong member in that missionary because they're able to persist through persecution. Wow, that's a really interesting point. So tell me about when you came home from your mission, you came home, you got married. Tell me about the part the church played in your married life, bringing up children, stuff like that. Yeah, um, marriage, uh, there was that... You know, I, th I think one of the things that my mission president said is one of my goals coming home was to find a wife, to get married. That was one of his invitations. And I ended up, you know, so I ended up meeting my wife. We, we dated um, off and on. Well, I shouldn't say off and on. We dated, we, once we met each other and we started going on like our first or second date, we saw each other every day until we were engaged. And I remember being in my office for the work, the, place I was working at the time, I remember specifically asking in prayer, is this, is this the woman that I should marry? And it's one of the few times in my life that I have had what I would consider an overwhelming, powerful spiritual experience. I was like, that did not come from me. One of the few times in my life that I said, if that's not God answering a prayer, I don't know what is. And so it wasn't, it wasn't with it was pretty shortly after that that I ended up uh, bringing up the, the idea of, of getting married. So we, both of our families, totally in the church. And that's something that I looked for in my wife was, do, do we have a good gospel foundation? Where's our foundation? And I could see her family, her work ethic, her love for the gospel, and her love for family. And that's what really drew me into her, of just how wonderful and beautiful a person that she was. And her family was wonderful. She has tons of siblings. But when we got married, we we went off to college and started doing, I think, just the newlywed things, right? We got callings and award. Our son came nine months and a week after we were married. You can do the math on that one. Uh, came right after we were married, and which we're grateful that we had children because it it taught us a lot. I've I've asked the question later in life, like, should we have waited? And I look at my kids now and I'm like, no, I think we're in a beautiful time in our life to, to raise our children. So raising them, you know, we we did all of the typical things. We made the flannel boards to do family home evenings and to put the plan of salvation up and watch the videos and, you know, served in all of those callings in the church. So to me, it was, I consider a pretty standard Mormon upbringing in the early part of our marriage with our kids. And at this point, how was your relationship with Jesus growing? You know, you talked about how you had basic understanding of Jesus Christ when you were a teenager. How was it growing? Was it kind of staying the same or was it growing and you were understanding him more? I'm trying to think of how that how that progressed. I want to say that that it, it continued to increase because I, I was putting it, the gospel into practice. We were, we were following the steps, right? The covenant path, they call it today. We were following the steps on our way back to God. And I could feel that love that God had for me. So I know that it incrementally grew because as I would serve people, I could see the benefits of, of helping and 
blessing people's lives. So yeah, it, it continued to grow uh, little by little. Yeah. So what went wrong, Doug? How did you end up leaving the church? <laughs> Sounds like you were super true blue Mormon and you were on the covenant path. It sounds like you were a really dedicated member. So tell me about your journey coming out of the church and let's start with where did it begin? Wow. There's so much in that question. There's so much. So for me, um, the process began decades ago, actually. So early, early on in our marriage, actually, I did start to have questions about the church. There were events that happened around 9-11. I would see things coming out from the government. I would see various messages that were being presented. And in my mind, I thought, well, that man, it was Hinckley at the time, right? Um, Gordon B. Hinckley. I thought, that man's a prophet. He must know something that I don't know because he's being quiet. They've got to be playing. They, they must be, they must know something's going on. And I realized now that my perception was completely off. Um, I just thought, well, there's something there that I don't know. And the reason that they're responding is that they're God's prophets. They, God speaks to them. There must be a reason. And so I had those early questions from, it's been literally two decades. Also around that time when I was first married, it was at my in-law's home that I read my first near-death experience book. And that has been an interesting journey for me to go down. Uh, Near-death experiences, or what we call NDEs, are really fascinating. I've read hundreds of them minimum. I've read hundreds. I don't believe everything that's in them. And I think that NDEs are very specific, tailored to the individual. But there's some pretty uh, astounding insights that we can, we can get from the lessons that they learned or principles that they learned. So some of those were really interesting. and. That's where later in my life, um, I had a friend share a book with me. It was an ND from a lady, and she really talked about these last day events. And I thought, oh, wow, look what's really going on. And I jumped into this world that I didn't even know existed, which was the, we could call it the prepper movement or last day signs, whatever. I spent a really long time studying these events and the signs of the times. And that was a great thing. I think it was. I think it was time well spent. I spent. A, I actually have a document that I wrote. That's oh, it's probably eighty six pages long. That details the research that I did about the last days, and it was taking ancient scripture, modern scripture, modern day dreams and visions, and then combining that with the LDS Church presidents and other church leaders. And I was just trying to get this idea of what's going on. Where where should I be? Like, are we really living in these times? It had a tendency. I, I think if we if we immerse ourselves too much in that, it, it can have a tendency to promote fear. And so, all of that questioning, like I, I have from the very beginning, questioning government. I have no idea how somebody trusts the media today. I really have no idea. Like I've come to understand, like people can dive deep into what they consider mind control. Mind control is used all the time on so many people. All forms of media and communication control and condition people. And so when the whole pandemic rolled out, you know, I had lots of questions and stuff well in advance of this. But when the pandemic rolled out, that really just tur it turned over a new leaf for everything. So the church went all in on everything. And I, I just stood there and was shocked. I and I was blown away. I was just like, you're kidding me. Like, you're supposed to be speaking with God, and you're telling me to, to listen to wise and thoughtful government leaders, and that this thing is a literal godsend that I should be injecting when it's purely experimental. And so I dove deep into research, and I'm not saying that my research was perfect. There was a lot of misinformation out there, but I know that fear was one of the things being promoted. And that, I was like, okay, there, there's fear for one. And then when, when the forced compulsion mandates came out, I thought, oh, well, yeah, like this is, this is definitely not what it, what it was sold as. It was something different. And that's when, when I saw the actions of the church leaders, I just thought, holy smokes. Um, I think the best thing they could have done 
was to invite all of the members to have church in their homes. So when that rolled out, we had church in our homes. We went back, maybe it was the spring of 2021. So about a year into it, we went, when they allowed church to come back, we attended for a few months. And then in the summer, we started to go camping more, and we just had church in the woods, did church with our family, and then we never went back. And that was the last time that we officially attended our own home ward. And so it's been a couple of years since we went to that ward. Do you have any questions up to this point? Because I could keep going. Yeah. So I want to backtrack just a little bit before I ask my next question that moves forward. So I want to talk a little bit about like your experience in the Mormon church in Idaho versus in Utah. And did you have more questions appear in your mind going to church in Utah? Did you notice toxic cultural things that were making you question more? Tell me a little bit about the difference in the culture with Utah Mormons versus other other areas of Mormons. Yeah, I mean, the area that I grew up in was, was heavily um, that farmer culture. So the people here are just genuinely good people. I look at my grandfather, a wonderful man, and even my dad, like my dad had some gospel foundation, but I really don't think they went much deeper to actually question a church authority because they had been conditioned their entire lives that these men are who they say they are. And you you just, you follow them because the prophet can't lead you astray, right? The, that one mantra in the church. And so very humble people that I met here. And that's not to say that Utah doesn't have very humble people. I met some incredibly humble people down there, but the culture there, well, to give you, Maybe this is not unique to Utah, but we walked into the ward for the first time and we met a couple and the guy the first time asked us who we were and we're like, oh, we're so-and-so, we live over here and we're renting here. And when we mentioned that we were temporary, meaning we were renting, I think that's the last conversation I had with him for three years in the ward because they knew that we were just passing through. So they didn't build any kind of rapport or relationship or anything with us. Now, I served in that ward as well as a scoutmaster. So I was intimately involved in the lives of all of the young men in these families. So I got to know them really well. And I think we made some phenomenal friendships. Some of the people there will give you the shirt off their back. They are so amazing. Um, they will give you the shirt off their back. And other people won't give you the time of day. You will you could walk into a room and somebody that you know, and they could look at you, you could wave and say hi, and they would just turn their head and walk away from you and not give you the time of day. So the, the culture overall is just hypersaturated with the church. Um, it was interesting to see even some of the youth down there, the families were so wealthy. Like the wealth down there is astounding. The average home was probably anywhere between 800 to $2.5 million homes. So extreme wealth. And I would consistently see the young men there have a lack of work ethic. Like that was very consistent. Some of them did work really hard. Some of them were in sports, but there was an extreme difference. I looked at the kids that I grew up with and a lot of those kids worked super hard when they were younger. And that generation down there, it was just like pulling teeth. I mean, we talked with all the leaders all the time, trying to do very basic things. Like on campouts, we would take them. I always had to curtail them and shorten like the distances we hiked or we car camped because I knew that they couldn't physically make it to do certain activities. So it was a, it, there was a, the people, the humble people in both places, but the culture down there was different than up here. Did you see the culture affecting your children at all as you were raising them? In that place down there, they were still pretty young when we raised them down in Utah. They were in, in those younger years I think the classes they attended, the typical primary and the Sunday school classes, they would have been the same ones that they, they would have gotten up here. Other than I did see that they would see the the wealth and the way that it was spent. Like, you know, my son had one, one friend that his dad was going to give him a PT. What, what was it? It was this really fancy truck, um, kind of an off-road truck. And he wanted a very specific Toyota. And so his, instead of just taking this brand new truck that his dad had, his dad went and bought him another different brand new truck so that he could have that one and it cost more insurance and all these other things that went with it. And I was just astounded. I was like, 
this doesn't happen. Like you've got like a $35,000 pickup truck that your dad's just going to give you the keys to. And you turned him down because you knew that he could buy you another vehicle that was just either a status symbol or something. And we, we taught our kids to help them understand that, that there's a big distinction in wealth and someone's connection with God. And so I think they were able to manage that well, but obviously there are things that do rub off when they see that type of a culture. Yeah, for sure. Did you feel like the church was doing something to kind of combat this entitlement that you're describing with the youth? Did you feel like the church was doing that when you were living in Utah? No, not really. I mean, I mean, in reality, if you were to look at the type of members who were called into leadership positions, for the most part, every state president that I've had is wealthy. They're they're usually in an upper tier of management with an in fact every single one of them were in an upper tier of a management position in a large large corporation and they were all very wealthy yeah makes you feel like you know callings and higher callings are more of a status than anything else right and i think we've kind of seen that leaking more and more and more into utah culture as the church gets deeper and deeper and deeper into things that are wicked and things that are not so good. I've lived in Utah my whole life, so I don't know the difference, but I definitely can pinpoint the things in culture that are really harming people in the long run and harming our young people. So I think that's very interesting, and I appreciate you sharing that. You know, a note about that, there is something of status that comes with receiving a calling in the church. Mm -hmm. When a bishop gets called, there is a status that goes with that. When a person gets called to a stake presidency, there are levels or perceived levels of righteousness that definitely go with those callings. Yeah, I can definitely see that. When my dad was a bishop, the whole ward was like shocked because he was kind of just a nobody. And he actually didn't even attend our ward because he had a calling in the BYU married ward. And so he always was at the BYU married ward. And so when he got called, everybody in our ward seemed very confused because this random guy that I'm sure some of them probably thought was just inactive and got called to be bishop. And um, it changed the way that people treated us because it was, we always say it, dad's calling as bishop was a, a call from God because we have no idea how it would have happened otherwise because we weren't these high status wealthy people. So that's definitely a pattern that I've seen too. So Tell me if you could pinpoint, let's say, maybe like the top three reasons you have for leaving the church. What would you say that those reasons were? The top three reasons. Well, so the one the one that was the tipping point was when I was asked to follow a church leader over the promptings that I received from God. Um, and I think that that would, that would probably extend into every other aspect of of my belief system can you delve into that story a little bit for us so that was yeah pandemic time um you know you can have your thoughts and opinions about how government tried to keep people safe and all of that but my uh i was serving on the high council at the time i'm kind of an interesting story about being called i was in the temple two weeks after we had arrived here and the week before i had seen a new state president get called and I'm in the temple and I look over, I'm like, oh, that's the new stake president. I don't even know his name. And we're waiting at the veil. And I look over and just said, hey, president, nice to meet you, something, something. And he just reaches over, says, hi, what's my name? He says, I was praying at the time to know who my next high counselor should be. And you reached over and introduced yourself and shook my hand. And so I was called into the high council. And within two years, I went from the most junior member of the high council to the senior high counselor. And it was really interesting to see the curtains pulled back as far as how a stake operates. I didn't know that. And I saw stuff in the stake that I was like, why are we operating this way? Why are we doing this? And I had lots of questions that now I have far more clarity on how things operated than I, than I, I do now versus what I did when I was in it. But when, when they started coming out and telling everybody to wear masks, I was just like, you know, these are conditioning devices. Like if you study what's going on behind it, like, it really isn't protecting you. And we were meeting as a council in the chapel because we could then social distance into our various little corners of the chapel. And my stake president walks in one day and he's wearing a mask and this is new. And I'm like, oh, great. What happened? 
And at the same time, my bishop had sent an email and said, if any of any, if any member comes to church, you need to wear a mask at all times in the building. And I basically told him, okay, but no, I'm not going to. I basically told him no. That must have got its way into the ear of my sick president. Because when I'm at this meeting, he walks in and basically says, our area presidency has told us, why are we not following the local mandates? Why aren't we listening to the local health board? And so that meeting finishes. And as he's walking out, he says, oh, Brother Nighting, do you mind chatting with me for a minute? So we go back into his office and the first words out of his mouth, he says, Brother Nighting, will you sustain me and your bishop in wearing a mask? And I, and I knew where the line of reasoning and the question was going to go. And I just laughed when he asked the question. We, we came to a resolution that I said, you know, the, the men, you know, the guidelines say I can walk through the door and take it off when I social distance. Are you cool with that? And he said, yes. Uh, but what was interesting, it took me months later to realize the reason he formed his question the way he did is because the word sustain has so much weight behind it in LDS culture. Because if you don't sustain a leader, you don't go to the temple. He was going to remove my temple recommend because I wouldn't put on a mask. And when I realized that, I remember going home, I think it was that Sunday, Sunday night, and God is just speaking to me. And he's like, Doug, you know you just like gave in, right? Like, you know exactly what's going on. I've, I've given you all of this information, this understanding, and you made a compromise. So I called him up. I think I, I either called him or I texted him the next morning. It's just, hey, we need to talk tonight. And all day I had this really heavy, if you've ever had the feeling where you can't eat, you feel sick to your stomach. And it's literally a, a spiritual oppression. I mean, there's a weight on my shoulders. And I remember... Before I had that call, I literally was, I, I would consider it be feeling tormented, just torn between, I think one of the biggest pressures was knowing that I was going against a man that was considered a leader of the church. And so I prayed, I remember kneeling down and praying, and in my mind's eye, I remember asking God to take that weight, that oppressive weight, and putting it on an altar. And I said, I will sacrifice this, sacrifice this to follow you. Rarely in my life have I felt a weight lift and a peace enter my heart like I did at that time. And that peace continued with me from that time forward. And it hasn't been perfect since then. And, and I've had a lot of questions and, and inner turmoil about things that I've, I've had to ask questions about. But that peace was beautiful. So the call with my sick president, we basically said, hey, look, if you need somebody to sustain you, in doing this thing, and I understand that the church, they had yet to promote uh, the shots. I said, I know that they're going to promote it. And if you need somebody to sustain you in that, that is not me. And he said, okay, I see that we need to make a change here. And there's some email exchanges back and forth where he essentially said, and this is pretty typical from a cultural standpoint in the church. He said, I know people that they if they feel that they have received revelation contrary to the leaders of the church, you can know with a surety that you are on the road to apostasy. And I've asked a lot of people that question, and that seems pretty typical in LDS culture. So I had a little bit of communication with my state president after that. He's a wonderful man. Like I, I talk about him in the sense of he did more to bring me to God than few other people on this earth because he gave me a choice to either listen to God or to listen to him. And I know that he would he would probably balk at the idea of what the, the decisions that I have made since that time. But man, I, I can't I can't have anything but love in my heart for him in helping me to grow spiritually since that time. So we we stopped attending, and that's when. I think it was the summer of 2021 is when I started to research deeper. And I think I'd probably have been doing this all through 2020 as well. But I started to research deeper into, well, what is the gospel? If I'm not going to this church, what is this temple? What is this tithing? And so that really pushed me into studying topics. And I created a massive library of research of all sorts of different topics. Yeah, that's amazing. So tell me, 
about delve a little deeper into your studies and more things because to my understanding you officially left the church last year is that right yeah i think it was the end of september first of november of last year okay so tell me a little bit about your findings and your studies that led you to make that decision what were more of your reasons where you were like oh something is off this is contradictory to scripture or whatever your findings were kind of pinpoint some of those for us yeah. Um, so the first essay that I wrote was about the teaching in the church that the prophet can never lead you astray. And the reason I think that that was so pivotal is because that is how church doctrine is defined. I know that some people like to say the church and the leaders are separate, right? The gospel is different than the leaders. And I would strongly argue against that because everything, the, the way that they interpret the scriptures becomes the gospel in the church. Anybody who studies church history should realize that there were doctrines taught in the early part of the church that are not taught today. And not only that, but you have leaders in more modern days condemning what a previous leader said. So the question is, is well, what was that the gospel? Was it not? So the one the one that I would say is probably the most influential teaching in the church that caused me to separate is the, is the teaching that the prophet can never lead you astray. And most members of the church will just say, oh, that's the official declaration. I think it's one or two where Wilfred Woodruff, you know, quotes that. And so I dug deeper and I found probably 150 instances from church resources where the church teaches that, and it goes all the way back to Brigham Young. Joseph Smith never taught that. In fact, he taught the opposite of that. So that was surprising for me to see the contrast when Joseph was alive and when things shifted with Brigham. And I know that Brigham actually taught both things. He taught that he was a fallible man, but then he also taught that he couldn't lead you astray. That happens more than I could ever imagine in, in the church today, that you get, we, we could call it two-faced, teachings, you could call it hypocrisy, or just double speak, right? They will teach one thing, and then they will teach another. So this, this principle that the prophet can't lead you astray, Jesus literally taught in his teachings, if we believe the New Testament, that even a true prophet can lead you astray. And that was one of my first ones. Um, one, of the, one of the essays that I wrote later on was about the parable in Joseph Smith translation, Mark 9. And that's where Jesus literally teaches that a prophet can lead you astray. The, the more fascinating part about that, though, is it, it blew my mind when I saw what the church had done um, with that verse of Scripture. So in the, if nobody's familiar with the parable of Joseph Smith's translation, Mark 9, so Mark 9 talks about three different symbolic elements. So there's a hand, a foot, and an eye. And the translation from Joseph Smith really adds beautiful clarity to what those symbols represented. The hand is a family nurturing environment. If those people are leading you away from God, you cut them off. Uh, societally, we walk after people, and that's the foot. So if they're doing it, it, it can be political, social work, whatever. Those people have the capacity to lead you astray. Cut them off. But then he gets to that one about the eye, and the description is really beautiful there. Um, I've actually got it pulled up here where Christ says, and if thine eye, which seeth for thee, him that is appointed to watch over thee, to show thee light, become a transgressor and offend, and offend thee, pluck him out. So it's a beautiful description of a seer and someone who has been literally appointed to be a watchman. Like, you can't get a better description. So I read that, and I just thought, well, what does the church really say about this? And I was floored. When I read it, it, if people aren't aware, the headings to the scriptures have a little recap from the church. This is what the church says. Jesus compares cutting off an offending hand or foot to discontinuing associations that may lead one astray. And I sat there and I looked at that and I said, they didn't, they didn't. So they referenced the hand and the foot and no eye, but they acknowledge that the parable taught by Christ is about people who can lead you astray. So there's a couple of things going on there. One, they're being deceptive because they know that there's a teaching in the church that, a, that Jesus literally taught that a true prophet can lead you astray. 
And by them removing that, they acknowledge that they want to hide it from the members of the church. So the reason that that's so significant is because everything, at least in a hierarchical structure of a religion like the LDS faith, is everything's a top-down structure. So if we can't question the guy at the top, then you either have to get in line or step out. Like there's, or, or you are happy with silence, right? And, and I know people that that's okay. So that was my number one one. I don't know if you have any questions about that, but that was one of my, my top traditions and teachings in the church that I knew I, I will call it anti-Christian because it's literally contrary to what Christ taught. So what would your response be to people who say things like, but the prophets and the apostles teach so many good things and there's so much good that comes out of the church? What would your response be to that? You know, I think that there are people in the church, you know, they can quote scripture just the same way that I can. I, this is the way I see it. When I was young in the church, I was very ignorant of the scriptures. I did not understand the scriptures and I was conditioned from the time I was young to leave the interpretation of scripture up to them. And so while I think that there are, I truly do believe that there are some very good people in leadership positions in the church. I think they're very humble people. I think they're very good people in the church. I have some deeply held feelings about some people in the church that I think are knowingly and willingly um, leading people astray. I think they know what they're doing is, is not right. But I do think that there are certain teachings. I, I, here's the way that I could put it. When I look at the early church and what Joseph said, I can take in name only so many practices that are good. Baptism, sacrament, uh, temple worship, keys and authority, um, service, ministering. I think we could almost touch on the majority of the you know, tithing, fast offerings, fasting, service, sacrifice. I could take every one of those principles and in name only, those are true principles. How we define those is where the nuts and the bolts of doctrine and the gospel actually come into play. And that's where my opinion differs on almost every single point. Um, there's yeah. very few doctrines or practices in the church that I would say, oh, I completely agree with that. Yeah, I think you just hit the nail on the head right there. It's the way that we define those practices that differ and that are, in a way, tearing people apart from each other because the culture is such a big deal that when we start to redefine and in more of alignment with what God is teaching, people tend to grind against it because we're so conditioned to just follow the leaders. Is that kind of what you've been seeing on this journey? Yeah, I, I tell you what, the the pressure to follow and to step in line. There, there's two different two different points I hit on. One of them in the handbook of instruction, it says that the way that the church defines apostasy is if you publicly, repeatedly, and publicly oppose a church leader. That's apostasy. It says nothing in there about going contrary to Christ and His gospel. Now, the the reasoning behind that that they can say that is because everything that they say is the word of the Lord. So to oppose a church leader is to literally oppose Jesus. And you have to ask yourself, what happens with an institution that says that the men at the top of that institution are on an equal footing, essentially, with, with Christ, if you disagree with them? Especially given when we have scriptures like 2 Nephi 28, 30, and 31, in 31, Jesus says, you will be cursed if you place your trust in the arm of flesh without getting a witness of the Spirit first. And in my letter of resignation, I put a note in there for my family, if they ever want to read it, that I said, if the, if the LDS leadership from the pulpit and general conference says, today you may hear truths and there may be things that are not true, it's your responsibility to ask the Spirit whether what we say is true or not, I'd be back in the, in the seats next Sunday because that allows a conversation for the members to then ask, well, did you, what did you hear? What did the Spirit teach you? And you have the ability to raise your hand and say, hey, I, I have a question. But of course, per handbook and tradition, if you publicly voice a dissenting opinion, you'll be excommunicated for apostasy. Yeah, and you see that too in the lives of members where they ask their leaders some of these questions and the leaders just kind of, 
they kind of pussyfoot around on it. They're just like, well, we're not really supposed to ask those questions. And probably a lot of them don't know the answers. And that's why they say that. But um, I feel like we should all be seeking for those answers so that we can be helping people on their journey with Christ, right? And, and think about what it does for somebody when you go into an environment and you know that you can't speak freely. How authentic can you be to yourself if you know that everyone else in that building is going to look at you if you have a different opinion? I mean, if people aren't aware, it, when people are sustained in church, it happens several times a year at general conference, you raise your hand in a sustaining vote. In my entire life, over 40 years, 45 years of being a member of the church, never did I once in a meeting that I was physically in, did I ever see a single dissenting vote ever. It was completely, I've never, and I know people that, that actually did um, in their communities and their wards, but I never did in 45 years. It would have, it would have turn every head in the congregation if someone were to have raised their hand and said, no, I don't agree. I don't agree with that. And so it's really difficult to be authentic in the church today. Like if I were to go there, I would just be like, well, per your tradition, I can't speak anything that may call into question the, the teachings of the church, which according to the members, those are perfect teachings as long as it's the living prophet. And that's why they push that so hard is because, uh, well, one, one member explained it this way. I was on Facebook chatting with them and he says, my, my simple opinion is that I follow the opinion of the church. And so he allowed, this person allowed the church to essentially form his perceptions of God and of what he was supposed to do in this life. And it shocked me that he expressed it that way. He's like, my my view of church history is whatever the church tells me it is. And I was like, wow, that literally is the curse that Jesus talks about that will come upon people if they blindly put their trust in someone. Yeah, absolutely. We had a bishop tell us that um, he would follow the prophet to hell if that's what it took. <laughs> <laughs> it's that conditioning that you're talking about because I don't even know if they fully realize what they're saying when they say things like that. Because the whole point of the church, I'm pretty sure, is to not go to hell. <laughs> At least we would hope yeah. that, right? So thank you for sharing all of your experiences in the church. Now tell us a little bit about where you're at now and what the gospel looks like in your life now that you've sent in your resignation and you're out of the church. What does the gospel look like now to you? So the gospel to me now, I've, my perception of God, it didn't change significantly, but in the areas that it changed, it was profound. I came to believe that there are good people in bad churches and there are bad people in good churches. And I really appreciated what one author wrote. Uh, Vinnie Tolman is a gentleman who wrote a book called Light After Death. And he said, the way that we perceive God Let's, let's take 100 people and put them in this amphitheater, and they're experiencing a rainbow. And they're going to write their experience about seeing, feeling, and the visceral experience of a rainbow. None of those experiences will be the same. They will all be different. Um, some of them will be a better description than others, but none of them will be a perfect description of who God is. And the only way to really experience a rainbow or to experience God is to experience God ourselves. That is, that is truly, I, I believe, what Joseph was trying to teach in the early restoration. And I believe that's what God wants us to do, is to experience God for ourselves. And so for one, God became far more loving than I ever thought imaginable, because God just wants our heart. He wants our heart and our mind, and He want, like the intent of our hearts is what He wants. So I, I found my walls of judgment falling down um, people who have tattoos, right? Tattoos were a big thing in, in, in LDS culture. I love asking people about the stories behind their tattoos. And I've had some amazing conversations with people. Um, I still hold a lot of like the word of wisdom. Like, I think that I really, I think caring for our bodies um, are beautiful. In fact, it shocked me when, 
the the church is asking us to use an experimental shot into our bodies when the word of wisdom literally talks about conspiring men in the last days that will try to harm you and i was just like oh that's really interesting but so as far as my the path forward i've had to essentially analyze what i consider all of the core doctrines in in the scriptures from a church standpoint and so i i dove into them and i have i have a folder that must contain 200 topics that i thought i wanted to write an essay on and i ended up a, not abandoning abandoning them but i put them aside because i found out that over time all i was doing was finding ways to nitpick things that i had a question about and i was like ooh i can i can get in there and i can you know put the screws to them as, as brigham would say i can i can get in there and i can really help people start to to expose what's going on in the church. And I got to a point where I was like, this isn't really helping me. It's not bringing light or happiness or joy in my life. And so a huge shift happened in that time. I, I guess I could bring this up and you're familiar with this, but I ended up studying a, a set of records that opened my understanding greater than I ever thought possible. Um, if people aren't familiar with the Nemenha records, um, it's essentially a, a history of Hagoth, who's a shipbuilder in the Book of Mormon. When he goes north, it's a record of his, his descendants for about 1,600 years. Their teachings in there are so beautiful. Um, when I compare their teachings to what I, what I believe Joseph was trying to teach, it mirrors so much of the early church. It's a people that lived the law of consecration for the majority of their time until the Gentiles came and pushed them out of their lands, which we know that modern day tale, but that's essentially the history period. That record alone literally blew the lid off of so much and surprisingly allowed me to hold on to so many things that I thought I may not hold on to that had been taught in the church. And when I say taught, it comes back to that name only, right? So many things in the temple. I think if we taught the temple in a more pure form and what the law of, you know, what we call either the pillar of knowledge or the gospel and obedience, sacrifice, chastity, and consecration. They're amazing. They are so amazing. In fact, what, when I, when I read the story about those, those pillars or those laws in the record, it breaks my heart to see what has become of it. Like literally it makes me want to cry because of what I believe Joseph was trying to do and what he was trying to teach. And then the shift that happened after he was killed. And so that's just a footnote on those records, extremely profound um, in helping me to come closer to God. Can you tell our audience where they can find these records if they're interested in diving into the Nemenha records? Yeah. If they wanted to dive in. So I have a website. If people aren't aware. So reluctantwatchman.com is my website. There is a section on there about revealing light. And I have a title of an essay called the Nemenha records. Now you can just Google them. Um, you can find them on, there's a website that um, prints their books, or you can download a PDF from them. I really appreciate the PDF because then I can do keyword searches and I mark it up on my iPad. So that's the preferred way that I read it. But that is that is one way or just Googling it um, and you can find it. Yeah. Um, I personally have delved into the Nemenha records as well in the past year and they're fantastic and I'm learning so much. And just like Doug, it's amazing how many of the things that I was questioning really hardcore that I realized it's not all bad. And it almost gave me an even greater gratitude for my experience in the church because you do reach a point where you get almost bitter that you've been lied to for so long. And I had to shed the bitterness to be able to learn and be taught by God the things that he needed to teach me. Do you relate to that, Doug? Can you tell our audience about that in your journey? Oh, yeah. I mean, there was, there was so much that I was able to learn as far as I mean, the core teachings of the church were there. Like, there's a lot of really good things that are there to be able to help us. Um, as far as the record itself, like, for example, I know a lot of people that when they leave the church, like the Book of Mormon becomes non-existent, or they'll, 
they'll try to pick it apart. When I read the Nemenhal records, my love for the Book of Mormon grew exponentially because you have this people that had separated themselves from the Nephite Lamanite culture. And throughout the entire record, they're analyzing what's happening historic historically down in that um, southern area. And for one, it helped me understand that scripture is not perfect, <clears throat> right? This, the story and narrative behind the Book of Mormon, the doctrine is really beautiful in the Book of Mormon, but every single story in the Book of Mormon was written through the lens of Mormon as he compiled a whole bunch of records. And I know that there's a lot of members that they will take, for example, the concept that, well, the Book of Mormon has the fullness of the gospel. And if there's a teaching or practice that doesn't show up there, they won't accept it at all. And that really helped me see that Joseph was trying to bring to light more understanding. Now, those principles aren't things that are demanded of us and required of us for salvation. All those things are. So, for example, I think it's in 35, 35 13, the Savior says, this is my gospel, faith, repentance, baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, right? I hear so many members quote that who have stepped away from the church, and they are so fixed on that that they won't contemplate other principles that might elevate their thinking. When Christ was teaching that in 3 Nephi, he wasn't saying that this is all of my gospel and there's nothing more because we could say, well, what am I having faith in and what am I repenting of? What was this whole Ten Commandments that you gave Moses? You know, why do we have that? Why do we have all these sermons that you spoke? Why do we have all these beautiful stories and allegories that you preached so we can we can see that the path really is simple the gospel is not complicated but i believe that there are practices that we can bring into our life like some people could say well tithing is never mentioned in the book of mormon and i would say well no no it is actually in fact not just tithing but the law of consecration is referenced in the book of mormon when alma is speaking to the poor people that were cast out of the city of zoram where he says, if you have a lot, give a lot. If you have a little, give a little. And if you don't have anything at all, know that your heart is in the right place, but you are to be given. That's the law of consecration. It's very simple. So there's so much, like you can literally find every, I'll say it name only, principle in the temple, the law in the temple found in the scriptures. They're all there. Chastity is there. Sacrifice is there. Um, one thing that I've been doing lately is studying more about what Christ's atonement meant, or at least how they teach the atonement. And Christ's atonement began before the foundation of this world. It wasn't just Gethsemane. It wasn't just on a cross. It happened way in advance. And the Holy Ghost plays a role more profound than anything that I've ever, ever realized in my life. Like, if, in fact, if you were to say, what's one of the core things that kept me from joining from well it aided in me leaving the church it's because the church promotes a glass ceiling of revelation there's a point where when god speaks to you your revelation has to stop somewhere i cannot understate or overstate however you want to put that i cannot say how important the holy ghost is in helping us reveal truth it's like Moroni 10.5, where it says, um, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. It's like we forgot that in the church because the church tells its members, oh, be careful. Don't go study that from that source over there. Just have reliable sources from our correlation department. It's like they forgot the Book of Mormon teaching that says, no, dude, if you guys have the Spirit with you, you literally will be able to know truth from error, right from wrong, righteousness from wickedness. So I've never seen a record... Um, that teaches the principle more frequently to validate all things through the spirit than that record. Um, hundreds, I, I would easily say hundreds of times. Yeah, I've definitely seen that in the record too. And it, it's amazing because it it really encourages this beautiful relationship with God, which is the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, right? But how often do we not even think about the Holy Spirit? Because, you know, that's just not, I didn't understand the, the difference or what part that played when I was younger until I started diving deeper. And then the Nemenhal record just opened this door. So I definitely see that for sure. So 
share with us some of the hardships that you faced from leaving the church and making that decision. So the question is, is what kind of hardships are, have come? It's, it's really difficult at the beginning to not have that bitterness. I know that you mentioned that. There are so many emotions that come up when, when you feel like you've been lied to. or I mean, not just feel like you've been lied to, but you see the deception. And when you read the scriptures and you realize that there are doctrines taught that 100% contradict what Jesus taught, you have to, it's really difficult to go through that because you see the impact of what those doctrines are cause you to judge people. It caused you to reject people who were kind people. As, as far as one of the things that is really difficult, and I would say I still am trying to figure this one out, it's being able to love my family members without thinking that they're judging me every time we get together. Um, my, my study of the gospel was, oh, how, how would I put this? It wasn't the best even even early on in my marriage, like I mean, you would study off and on, but I wasn't I wasn't immersed in the scriptures. It was only when I had those questions that I dove in. And so my life right now, like if I were to sit down with a family member, one of the topics that would come up would be religiosity. It would be my spirituality. It would be things that I'm learning. And so when I go to these meetings with with family and friends, it's really hard sometimes to sit there and talk about the weather. Because I'm just like, do you see this? Do you see this? And in fact, I, since having stopped attending church, I have studied conference talks more than I ever did when conference was going on, when I thought I was a faithful member of the church. And the reason why is because I wanted to know, are these men actually speaking for God? Like when they teach something, can I critically look at it? And so that is one of the hard things is um, I have seen family members pull back and pull away. Um, I had a conversation with a brother-in-law right after I put out a social media post telling everyone not to get a shot. And they jumped all over me. Um, from that day on, a very, I will say, spiritual and physical divide happened in my family. And there's a lot of family that to this day, we don't talk anymore. And we had a conversation one time on the phone, it got a little heated because I was still, these emotions are still very raw because I thought these shots are killing people. People that I know, they're hurting people. Like this is, this is really damaging people. And we had a conversation. He was trying to apologize because he, he had on social media told me that I was wrong and that I'm not the prophet. I never claimed to be a prophet, but I was questioning the prophet, which in their minds, I was literally questioning God. And so we had a conversation and he says, Doug, why are you tearing down people's faith? And I had never seen that. Like, that's the difficult thing that's been really hard for me is to have the thoughts and feelings in my heart that I have for God and how God loves us and works with us. And I thought that all of my intention was to help reduce suffering. That when we can understand true, true principles and given people will question that and say, well, true to you, right? And I'm like, well, yes, these are things that God has revealed to me. And they have blessed my life. I have seen the fruits of them now and how beautiful they are. He literally thought that I was tearing down people's faith when all I was doing was trying to question and clarify what is Christ's gospel and what did he teach? And that was really difficult when someone, well, even, well, I mentioned to you before we jumped on the call, I had somebody email me just uh, this week and they told me that I was just like Alma the Younger and that I was tearing down the church. And I just sat there and I've had to learn to just realize that I love them, I pray for them, and I know that they're on a path of wherever they're at, but I feel like I've been there. And I used to hold those same feelings. I would see people and think, oh, those people are past feeling, right? They're like Laman and Lemuel. Anyone who leaves the church has obviously left God. Oh, and by the way, the church teaches you that, right? Brad Wilcox had a talk where he says, if you leave this church, you lose everything, which includes your connection with God, your understanding of who God is. And there's fear, the literally driven into the hearts of young men and young women at these um, young at these firesides, teaching them that if they leave the church, they literally will, will lose their eternal identity, 
and salvation in the eons and eternities of time. Yeah, it's kind of crazy that it's the church that is the link to our salvation, and it's not Jesus Christ anymore. It's become almost solely the church, the church, the church. And that's, I feel like that's a tragedy in society. Um, so tell me, how have you come closer to Christ since all these things have happened? You've had hard experiences. You've had good experiences. How have you come closer to Christ? And what does that look like now in your life? Right? Christ became far more relatable in the sense that he did so much for me. Um, I didn't realize the sacrifices that he made to be able to help us. And I found that G Jesus literally has, he does not judge us in the sense that I was always taught. He will always love us regardless. Um, I also did find, though, that as part of his love, like love is a really interesting concept. When it teaches in John that God sent his son down because he loved the world, you can read all throughout Jesus' teachings that he asked us to repent and to turn. You'll notice that he invited us to do all sorts of things to bring more joy into our lives as we helped people. And that also meant sacrifice. The principle of sacrifice is one that I'm learning little by little is a beautiful, beautiful doctrine that when we give of ourselves voluntarily, not by compulsion, um, compulsion is not a way of heaven, but voluntarily that is what God wants. And so Christ, Christ did so many beautiful things. And his gospel is, I will say, simple, but it's more profound and deep than anything that I ever thought possible. Um, it is really, really beautiful. And so I have found that Christ is so willing to meet me whenever I want to turn to him and that I can find that peace. We are, we are all fallen. Um, when we, when I've learned a lot about the narrative about the garden or what we could call the Garden of Eden, it is essentially a story of all of us. It is a story of mankind. It is not our condemnation of a woman who partook of an apple. Okay, that, that entire story is, for all intents and purposes, allegorical. It's a symbolism of us. We should put us in that state. We are all fallen. And Christ is the difference. What he did for us, his sacrifice for us, his teachings for us. I mean, his example is what we should be striving to follow and to exemplify. And I do believe that he wants us to be taught by messengers, which can be good. But more than that, I believe he wants us to be taught directly by him. And I've felt those promptings and those urges and those impressions as I have sat in meditation and I have studied that I know come from God. I know that they come from the Lord. As we study his fruits, like his teachings, even though they've been translated through the writings of men, for the most part are beautiful, right? Not every time a man says, thus saith the Lord, was the Lord actually telling him to do that thing. But if we're able to measure the fruits of those things, then we can find what his gospel is. And it is, it is beautiful and it is simple. I love that. It's beautiful and it's simple, and we need to be measuring the fruits. I absolutely love that. So last question, Doug, how do you find clarity in your life now? How do I find clarity? That's an excellent question. You know, I, I think we should ask it often. Um, how do we define who we are and, and what is God asking us to do in our own life? Um, independent of any other person, I think that for me, clarity is being able to have a conversation with God and have God speak to me and say, this is a good thing for you to pursue at this time. And some things I felt very much inspired to do, things that I've been inspired to study, people that I've, I've been encouraged or felt prompted to reach out and to speak to. But any time that we can feel love in our life, like if we feel the fruits, I, I believe that it's very profound when Lehi gave his discourse where he said there's opposition in all things, there's righteousness and wickedness. I know that some people don't like to say that they know something to be true, but I believe that I can say that love is greater than fear. 
I believe that I can say that sacrificing for someone else is greater than selfishness. And for me, that's clarity, is to be able to know that God loves us perfectly and beautifully and unconditionally. I love that. I love that so much. I think that's a message that all of us, no matter where we're at in our spiritual journeys, whether we're in the church, out of the church, or in another church, or coming out of another church, <laughs> that is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Love is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I absolutely love that. Thank you so much, Doug, for coming onto the Clarity Podcast. It's been a pleasure talking with you. If you guys are interested in finding Doug, you can find him on thereluctantwatchman.com. Uh, one more question, Doug. Why did you decide to name your website The Reluctant Watchman? A bit of a funny story. Um, so people may be familiar with the phrase The Reluctant Statesman. So that came from George Mason, who was a statesman. He actually helped write some, I believe it's the early Virginia State Bill of Rights. He actually was instrumental in writing the official Bill of Rights, as well as some of the language for the Constitution of the United States. The reason they call him the reluctant statesman is because he felt that the Constitution didn't do enough to abolish slavery and that he felt that it gave too much power to the federal government. So he was reluctant to sign his name to the Constitution of the United States. And the reason I chose that is because I look at all of the doctrines that I was raised with, I'm still very willing to support truth and ideas, but I'm not one that's going to say, well, the church told me to do this, so I'm going to do that, and I'm going to sign my name on that, you know, that temple recommend that says that I have to pay my tithing in this way, and I have to obey a church leader, and all of the other things. And so, I, I, I love the concept of watchmen in the scriptures, um, and I just thought, you know, the parallels between this concept of reluctancy, George Mason it didn't stop him from doing what he was doing. He was reluctant, but he was extremely engaged in the process of helping people understand freedom and, and liberties. And I hope that that comes through in my desire to help people come closer to God. I love that. That's awesome. All right, guys. So you can find Doug on the reluctant watchman.com. I would highly, highly recommend checking out his website. I know that his website helped me a lot as God was teaching me things. And also just on this journey of coming out of the church and feeling like, am I the only person on this planet who thinks this way and that God is giving these revelations to? And I found Doug's website and it was just like, oh my goodness, okay, I'm not alone in this world. Like God is teaching all of his children. He's helping us to come out of bondage. He is helping us to gain a greater understanding of who he is and how we can live his gospel. And I feel like Doug has really done that through his website. So go check out thereluctantwatchman.com. And thank you so much, Doug, for coming on the podcast. Hey, thanks, Claire. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of The Clarity Podcast. If you guys are interested in coming on the podcast and sharing your story of how you have come out of the Mormon church to follow Christ or have come out of really any church to follow Christ at a deeper and more personable level, please feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on clarity.podcast at gmail.com or you can DM me directly at Forged in His Fire on Facebook and on Instagram. If you guys are interested, feel free to reach out to me. We would love to hear your story of how you found clarity through Christ in your life. All this and more on the Clarity Podcast.